So in this block, we will discuss the points of Edmund Spencer, Epithalamium, Prothalamium, and two sonnets from Amoretti. All right. So, yeah. So last class, we have discussed the literature of 14th century. So Chaucer's age was from 1340 to 1400. Uh, so period after 1400 to 1552, that was a dormant period in English literature. Hmm? So literature remained in a dormant state until the birth of the great poet Edmund Spencer in 1552. Okay, so Spencerian time or Spencerian ages from 1552 to 1599. Okay, so apart from that, see uh, Spencer's age overlaps with that of Elizabethan age. Okay, he belongs to the Elizabethan era. And Elizabethan era starts in 1558 to 60 and ends in 1625. Okay, I repeat, 1558 to 1625. You know why period uh, from 1558 to 1625 is termed as Elizabethan era or the golden period of English poetry because it's in 1558 that Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth accented to rule. Okay, she became the queen of England and uh, yeah and in 1603 she died okay that's that was the reason why uh, the period is known as Elizabethan era and uh, she is a very you know uh, a staunch patriot and she encouraged all poets and other artists hmm, in England yeah so for that reason the period is uh, yeah, largely known as the golden period of English literature. So it is during her reign the famous uh, writers like you know Christopher Marlowe, yeah, El, El, I mean William Wordsworth, Spencer, Ben Johnson, then yeah John Lilly, I mean University Wits, etc. All emerged. Okay, so now let's discuss about Edmund Spencer. So I told you, he's the second greatest poet after Chaucer, Geoffrey Chaucer. I told you, Geoffrey Chaucer is the father of English poetry. Uh, then he is known, I see this person has won several, uh, uh, I mean, acclamations like poet's poet, prince of poets, mullah's bard. So let me ask you a question. Who is known as uh, poet's poet in Malayalam? Uh, we do have a poet. Poets poet or Kavigal de Kavi or Kavirajan, who is uh, known as Poets poet in Malayalam? Any idea? No, no, it's Swati Tirunal, Poets poet. All right, similarly, that title goes to Edmund Spencer in English literature. Okay, caught not that point, Poets poet. He was called Poets poet by Charles Lamb, famous essayist in English. Okay, literature. Charles Lamb. It is Charles Lamb who called him poets poet. He's also known as the Prince of Poets. Okay, now the other title that, uh, yeah, uh, often associated with Edmund Spencer is Mullah's Bard. See, actually, who is known as Bard of Avon? Bard of Avon. Who is popularly known as ba Bard of Avon? Stratford Avon. Shakespeare. Shakespeare. Yeah, Shakespeare. Yes, it is Shakespeare. So this person was known as Mullah's Bard. So Mullah is a river in Ireland. Okay, Mullah is a river in Ireland. Even though Spencer, uh, you know, uh, he's uh, yeah, he belongs to England, but he was sent to Ireland for uh, to suppress some I uh, Irish rebellion. So he was forced to say stay in Ireland for a long time. And it is in Ireland he compiled almost all his um, most famous poems. So, okay, Mullah is a river hmm, that passed through, uh, I mean, beside the castle, Kilcoman, uh, where our Edmund Spencer stayed. Okay, so he is known as Mullah's Bard and Rubens of English poetry. So, I told you this person has won several acclamations. Okay. Now, so during those period, we need patrons or sponsors. Hmm? So has to become famous and all. So Earl of Leicester and Sir Philip Sidney were his patrons. Not, not the name of his patron, Earl of Leicester and Sir Philip Sidney. Philip Sidney is quite famous. Okay, the one who authored, uh, uh, yeah, apology to poetry. Okay, now, yeah. Then he was married to Elizabeth Boyle in 1594 and he was also buried in... Westminster Abbey. Okay, the first person to buried in Westminster Abbey is 
Jeffrey Chaucer. I hope you know that Westminster Abbey is Poets Graveyard. Okay, Poets Corner. I mean, all those acclaimed poets hmm, are buried in West, uh, Westminster Abbey. Now, his major works. The major works of Edmund Spencer are Shepherd's Calendar. Okay, so there are 12 o'clock. See, uh, in Shepherd's Calendar, there are 12 o'clock. And 12 o'clock represent 12 months of a year. And Fairy Queen. Fairy Queen uh, is like, you know, um, it's an allegory which he has dedicated to Queen Elizabeth. So Queen Elizabeth is the central character of uh, Fairy Queen. It's all about uh, Queen Elizabeth and her knights. Yeah. Now, complaints. You know, uh, that is uh, a satirical poem where he complains about his, you know, his uh, personal problems. See, this person, Edmund Spencer, is very ambitious. He was very ambitious and he always uh, dreamt of getting a, you know, a reputable position in England's court. I mean, Queen Elizabeth court. You know, uh, actually, he doesn't have a noble origin. So he always wanted to, you know, uh, elevate or uplift his position. So that's why, you know, he's an opportunist. Well, he is an opportunist. Mm, so wherever he gets some chance to uplift his uh, uh, position, he used it. He utilized it because this person is quite good in, you know, forming bonds with person who belongs to upper class, uh, I mean, upper strata, especially, see, a lovely sister, then another one, Sir Philip Sidney. So similarly, uh, this person was longing for a position in England's court. But, uh, you know, unfortunately, he hasn't got, he was forced to remain in Ireland for a long time. So he mentioned about all those complaints in, yeah, complaints. Then Daphne da is an elegy. Okay, that is an elegy uh, where he mourned the death of his uh, friend. Okay. Now, calling clothes come home again. Uh, you know, that is also a poem where he discusses about her uh, return to England. Astrophel, Amoretti. Yeah, Amoretti is a love, love sonnet, Epithalamian, which we will study in this block. That is a nuptial song, a marriage song. Then, <coughs> yeah, four hymns. That is a, you know, that's a pastoral poem. Then Prothalamium or a spousal verse. That is a pre-marriage song. Okay, Prothalamium also we will uh, study in this uh, block. So, and Amoretti and Epithalamium. These two works are dedicated to his wife, Elizabeth Boyle. Okay. Amriti is a collection of 89 sonnets. Okay, 89 sonnets. Now, yeah. So let's start with Epithalamium. So Epithalamium is a special poem written in honor of a marriage, especially, hmm? yeah, his own marriage. So, you know, Epithalamium is a bridal song. Okay, or we can say that... Uh, a song dedicated to a bride who is uh, on her way to yeah bridal chamber so the very meaning of the word is bridal song okay so ep yeah so epithalamium is a greek term epi means upon thalamium means bridal chamber all right so i have already told you uh, this person married elizabeth uh, boyle in, in 1598 it's on the wedding day uh, he uh, dedicated this poem to his uh, uh, wife, Elizabeth Boy, in lieu of many ornaments. Actually, he has planned to give some precious gift to uh, his beloved, or uh, some precious jewels to his beloved. But due to, uh, you know, uh, some incident, he couldn't give that to his love. For that reason, he compensated that, uh, you know, that loss by writing epithalamium okay so this was first published in 1595 hmm, as a in a volume entitled amoretti and epithalamium so yeah so yeah amoretti uh we have already i have already told you that it's a collection of 89 sonnets love sonnets okay now structure of epithalamium now let's discuss the very structure of this poem so there are 24 stanzas in the poem there are 24 stanzas so each stanza hmm, 
has either 18 lines or 19 lines. 18 lines or 90 lines. Okay. And see, except 15 stanza, 15 stanza, uh, stanza has only 17 lines. And the last stanza, last stanza is an envoy. Envoy, you know, uh, envoy is a short stanza of seven lines, usually used in ballad. Ballad, ballad. Okay. So I, I repeat. There are 24 stanzas in the poem. Each stanza has either 18 lines or 17 lines, except 15 stanza and the last stanza. 15 stanza has only 17 lines and last stanza has only 7 lines. So last stanza is written in the form of an envoy. Envoy is a, in a poetical form used in ballad. Okay, so altogether there, there are 433 lines in total. In total there are 433 lines. So the 24 stanzas represent 24 hours of a day. 24 stanzas, just like in Shepherd's calendar, there are 12 o'clocks. So 12 o'clocks represent 12 months. So here in epithalamium, 24 stanzas represent 24 hours of a day. Now, see, I told you there are 433 lines in total. In that 433 line, 365 lines are longer and 68 Hmm, lines are shorter. So 365 days, hmm, sorry, 365 lines represent 365 days of the year. Okay. Now, uh, out of the 24 stanza, 16 stanza represent daytime and last 18 stanza represent nighttime. So this is the very structure of epithalamium. Okay. Please have a good look at it. Now, <clears throat> so we have already discussed that See, Charles's Canterbury tale is written in heroic couplet. So I've already told you what a heroic couplet is. I am big, rhymed I am big pentameter. Isn't it rhymed I am big pentameter? Now, epithalamium is also written in, uh, you know, a, a rhymed I am big pentameter, except the last line. Last, last line is in Alexandrine. Okay, Alexandrine means, you know, uh, rhymed, Iambic hexameter. Iambic hexameter. There are six feet. Okay. Now, see this person. <clears throat> okay. Hello. Yeah, this person has developed his own rhyming scheme. Yeah, he has contributed his own rhyming scheme to English literature. So, Spencerian rhyming scheme goes like this A, B, A, B, B, C, B, C, C, D, C, D, E, E. I hope you can see. The rhyming scheme on the screen. See, strand and hand rhyme, away and pray rhyme, like that. S A and D K rhyme. So A B A B B C B C C D C D. Yeah, yeah. Ask me. Excuse me. Are you presenting something? Yes, yes. I'm presenting. But nothing is nothing is visible. Only now it is. Okay. Now. Okay. Till now nothing was. Oh, uh, all right, all right. So is there, so how many of you can see my slide? Is there anyone left behind who's not able to see the slide on the screen? Hello? It is visible now. Okay, okay. So this is... Visible now. Okay, so whenever you're writing, you know, annotation or essay, let it be annotation or essay. So in the first paragraph, especially in the introductory paragraph, just give some details about the poem, especially uh, in... What's the rhyming scheme of the poem? What's the meter used? Hmm? The background details of the work, not about the poet. No need to describe uh, lines and lines about the poet and about his uh, major works. You just give background information about the poem, just like I said, the structure of epithalamium. If you're if you're getting, yeah, if you're getting, hello, would you mind muting your mic? Would you mind muting your mic? Yeah. So if you're getting an annotation about epithalamium. Yeah, just like uh, write two lines about the poet hmm? and he is known as so and so. After that, just concentrate about the poem, the structure of the poem. Then you may write what the rhyming scheme used, meter used. Yeah. So, see this? Unstressed followed by a stress. Oh, sorry. One second. See, see, see this? Unstressed followed by a stress. One, two, three, four, five. I am big pentameter. I hope you understood. 
see all these meters cancelled doesn't have any 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 particular rule to follow you know it's how you pronounce but you have you have to follow certain tricks so has to get the correct uh right i mean what do you call it? meter and all one unstressed day stressed i unstressed road stressed her unstressed name so wherever whichever syllables you stress or see in certain syllables you you will have long vowels diphthongs etc that you will mark as stressed okay upon if it is long vowel usually we will mark that stressed syllable so that is the strategy that we follow while while during scansion anyway scansion is not asked but i told you just for the sake of uh, information okay now spenserian sonnet was invented by edmund spenser used as a rhyming scheme hmm? see uses uh, the very rhyming scheme i have already told you it's a b a b b c b c c d c d e e please not that you have to incorporate that in the essay and in the what toy i mean annotation so three quatrains followed by a by one heroic couplet that's a very style okay so yeah hero couplet we have already seen what a heroic couplet is i am refers to one food hmm? unstressed followed by stressed and penda means five feet hexa means six now so yeah epithalamium follows a rhyming scheme of hmm, the very rhyming scheme of epithalamium is a bit different a b a b c c d e d e f f that is the rhyming scheme except 15 stanza x 15 stanza has got the rhyming scheme a b a b c c f e g g h h this is the rhyming scheme of the epithelium all right so you just work out work by yourself you you will get uh, the rhyming scheme is pretty easy okay now let's discuss about the poem epithalamian okay so i'll teach you how to read this poem uh, we'll explain the first stanza for you so let me tell you uh, even some words just like chaucer's can it is not as complicated as chaucer's uh, canterbury tales but you know still words used by Ed edmund spencer hmm? uh yeah it is slightly different from the modern english especially i think you can see y e u that is u okay then you see l a y e s that is uh line praise p r a y s e that is modern praise p r a i s e you no know, there are small small difference in the spelling modern actually spencer's age or his works were still under the influence of Hmm? middle english still it is not that difficult you can easily relate it with modern english okay so let's discuss the poem you learn sisters which have often times been to aiding me others to add on whom you thought worthy of your graceful rhymes that even the greatest did not greatly scorn to hear their names sung in your simple lines but joy in the phrase and when you list your own mishaps to mourn which death or love or fortune's wreck did raise your string could soon to sadder turn uh turn a turn and teach the woods waters to lament your doleful derriment and now lay those solf sorrowful complaints aside and having all your heads with girl and crown help me my own lines praises to resound now let the same of any be in your so i unto myself along will sing the wood shall to me answer and my echo ring so see uh this is a an epic love song an epic love song so we know that before uh, compiling an epic song it is quite natural that almost all poet will invoke their favorite deities isn't it their patrons their patron goddess or god or goddesses see why uh, before writing ramayana and mahabharata yeah both vyasa and valmiki they have invoked ganapati ganesh isn't it lord ganesh similarly you know uh, if it is 
Greek poet, yeah, Greek poets, Roman poets, etc. They have always invoked Apollo or Athena hmm? or the so-called muses of poetry. So similarly, you know, uh, our Edmund Spencer, he is also invoking those muses. Muses means goddesses. Okay. So you learn sisters which have oftentimes been to me aiding others to adopt. So you learn sister here means the nine muses. The nine muses. See the first one, Calipo, the muse of epic poetry, Cleo, the muse of history, Entropy, the muse of flute, Melponine, the mess, I mean, the muse of tragedy. Then another one, Turpis, the muse of dancing, Urania, the muse of astronomy, Thalia, the muse of comedy, Erato, the muse of liar, Pol Polyhymnia, the muse of Say, yeah, sacred song or sacred poetry. So they are akin to our Saraswati, Ganesh, etc. in Hindu mythology. So all these, you know, uh, muses are daughters of Nimosin. Okay, Nimosin. So he is invoking those nine muses before writing uh, this epic poem. So he asked. Uh, them to help him because several times these learned sisters have helped Edmund Spencer to write poetry or poems praising others. You learn sisters which oftentimes been to me aiding others to add on. See, several times you people have helped me to uh, write poems praising others. Whom you thought worthy of your graceful rhymes that even the greatest did not greatly scorn. See, why did those nine muses help Edmund Spencer to write poems? Because these nine muses thought that those people whom Edmund Spencer praised in his poems, they are quite worthy enough to be praised. That is why they have given uh, the gift of words to Edmund Spencer to praise them in his poetry. Okay, to hear their names sung in your simple lines but joyed in their praise. Okay, so this uh, person has written so many poems uh, praising uh, Ellie's sister. I mean, another one, Philip Sidney, then Queen Elizabeth, like that. I mean, those people who held, uh, you know, great reputation in society. So, uh, see, when this person reads the poem in front of them, even those people, they never ha uh, uh, have grown, sense I mean, insensitive to the poems, but they have greatly enjoyed when they heard their names, uh, yeah, have been praised through his poems. Okay, so they, they, uh, they were very pleased with Edmund Spencer's work. I mean, those people uh, whose name, Edmund Spencer has celebrated in his poem. Actually, they were very pleased with his work. Okay. And when you list your own mishap to mourn and wish death or love or fortune's wreck did raise, your string could soon to saddle turn turn. Okay. So why this person has got several acclamations? Because all these learned sisters, nine muses are there to help him always okay these nine muses are always there uh, with Edmund Spencer when he compiles the poetry so uh, several times they have helped him in compiling happy poems not only writing uh, happy poems but they have also helped in writing you know sad poems as well so see when you list your own mishaps to mourn see when these nine muses hmm, uh, became uh, when they yeah when they become sad now what happens uh, if they are sad about the death, love or misfortunes? See, their slight change in the, uh, see when they play the string, obviously that will be reflected in the musical instrument, isn't it? So yeah, a person's emotion will be reflected in the song or in the uh, uh, instruments played. So that could affect woods and the waters nearby. 
Yeah, even the very poems written by Edmund Spencer. Hmm? Uh, yeah, it uh, it uh, it have it, it has touched the forest and rivers. Okay. Now lay those soulful complaints aside having all your heads with girl and crown now see it is not the time to discuss about those sorrowful complaints or about those laments okay now you please hmm, keep all the all those things aside now it's a time of celebration help me my own lines praises to resolve this time please help me to compile my own poem okay see please help me see so far I haven't compiled any poem for uh, my sake or for my beloved. Okay, so till date he has compiled poem for other people. I mean those people uh, who held upper position in the society and all. Okay, it is for the first time I am writing something for my own. So please help me to write something big, something great. Let it resound. Now let the same of my same of any and you so unto myself alone will sing the wood shall to me answer and my echo ring so uh he just want to attain the same you know uh what do you call uh status when he wrote other poems hmm? he wanted to celebrate this poem he wanted to make this poem something great or something really big because he is dedicating this poem to his beloved so please help me to compile this poem and you know i am writing this for myself not to please anyone so there is a you know uh, in epithalamium and in prothalamium uh, not only in epithalamium but prothalamium but almost in all works uh, this edmund spencer has used lot of mythical allusions hmm? he yeah he is quite obsessed with greek mythology greek mythology and this person has notoriously you know um yeah used it in different ways see sometimes he has switched with the words when you search on uh yeah when you search on google you will get different different names that is why i said uh, this person has notoriously switched certain mythical names okay so in the last line he says that it is it is uh, see i'm writing this song for myself okay it's for my sake it's for my beloved i'm not writing it for someone else uh, there is a mythical allusion a small mythical allusion is uh, there in the last two lines see i hope you know that uh, orpheus orpheus is a greek poet a famous greek poet and uh, yeah a greek musician i'm sorry it's a greek musician so he has been gifted with the power to animate the inanimate objects okay when he plays his flute and when he sings you know uh, even the mountain and the trees hmm, uh, moved okay he has got the capacity to move mountains and trees so his wife's name is eurydice eurid orpheus wife's name is eurydice once she happened to follow the seed of romy granite and she died uh, it is termed as the evil seed okay evil seed and she died and her soul was taken to underworld so who is the god of underworld it's pluto right so pluto pluto's wife's name is persephone persephone pluto and persephone and you know uh, orpheus he really wanted to get back his wife's soul so he went to the underworld and he uh, played his instrument he was able to convince pluto and persephone and they were you know uh, they were very much uh, they became very much happy with uh, his songs and they have given him the boon that uh, they ca he can take his wife soul eurydice to earth back to earth but upon one condition see uh, of course uh, he can take her to the earth but he shouldn't turn back until he reaches the surface of the earth actually it's like a tunnel okay it's, uh, he ha he had gone to underworld so you know uh, he has taken his wife uh, almost to the surface of the earth but unfortunately you know uh, uh, he became very uh, very suspicious or he, yeah he, he became very doubtful whether his wife is still following him or pluto is simply befooling him 
So in order to confirm, he's just turned back. He, he has almost reached the surface of the earth. He turned back to make sure that his wife is following him. His wife, wife is coming along with him. But at that time, uh, he forgot the condition hmm, made by Pluto that he should not, he should never turn back until he reaches the surface of the earth. Okay, he turned back, the soul of Eurydice disappears. Unfortunately, you, uh, Orpheus hasn't got his wife's soul. He failed to bring back his wife uh, back in life. Okay, so that's the very story of you, uh, Orpheus and Eurydice. It is, uh, uh, yeah, it is that story which is referred in the last two lines. See, help me my own line spaces to resound. Now let the same be, yeah, same of any be in your. So I unto myself alone will sing. See, I unto myself alone will sing. See, I am singing this song for myself. I don't want to praise anyone just like Orpheus praised. Uh, you know, Orpheus has sung for Pluto and his wife Persephone. I don't want to please anyone. If I ever... Uh, yeah, if I ever please them, it will, uh, I'll be uh, using it to please my beloved. So until then, what shall to me answer and my echo ring? So you see the last line, that is a refrain. The last line is repeating in all 23 stanzas. Now, now let us discuss. Uh, so that's all about the first stanza. Similarly, the lines you can uh, relate with the modern English. Okay? It's not that difficult. Now, uh, I'll summarize the poem. <clears throat> so, first stanza we have all, uh, already discussed. It is a kind of invocation. He's invoking nine muses. Now, in the second stanza, you know, uh, after praising uh, the muses, he's asking those muses to rise before his, uh, before his beloved wakes up. Mm? So, after mm, waking up, he's asking... Uh, the nine muses to go to the chamber of his beloved. Okay, his beloved is still asleep. So he's asking those nine muses to wake her up. Because the god of marriage, who is known as the god of marriage? Hyman is known as the god of marriage. He has already awakened and now he is getting ready for the marriage procession. You know, it is Hyman who uh, gives signal to uh, for the marriage, hmm? marriage ceremony and all. So anyway, the god of uh, marriage, Hyman, ha is already ready. Mm? Uh, and he is also, see, not only Edmund Spencer, many young men, young boys are waiting for the god of marriage. Okay. Um, now, it is now uh, he's asking those nine muses to uh, make, uh, yeah, to groom his lady. Love. Okay, now the now the third stanza. He's asking muses to bring flowers from the forest. Yeah, forest. Uh, not only the muses of the forest, he's also invoking the muses of river, mm? and he's asking them to carry flowers from forest. So has to adorn his wife and the chamber, the uh, I mean, the bower. Okay. Now, in the fourth stanza, he is talking about, uh, now, he is invoking the names of Mullah. I told you, uh, Mullah is a river in Ireland where, uh, I mean, beside Mullah River, there stood a castle called Kilko Man. And the castle uh, belonged to an Irish rebel. Edmund Spencer got that castle as a gift from uh and yeah queen elizabeth for suppress suppressing the irish rebellion okay originally the castle belongs to an irish no uh noble man uh he got it as a gift okay so he is uh residing in that castle now so he is invoking the muses all the names of mullah river and the mountains he requested them uh, to help his beloved in dressing up and decorating herself. Okay. So, and he also joins, uh, yeah, he also asked them to join in the choirs as songsters. Okay. 
Now stanza number five. See, Boyle hmm, advises uh, his wife that Elizabeth Boyle to get up because it's their marriage day. Hmm, sun is already in the sky. Now, you know, uh, <clears throat> so, you know, uh, she wakes up. Now, in sixth stanza, she wakes up. Uh, so, as usual, this poet is describing her beauty. And, you know, this mar epithalamium is a love song, a marriage song. It is a, see, where his romantic feelings have overflowed. Mm? The entire po uh, poem is, you know, uh, brimming with his romantic feelings. <clears throat> so, now, stanza number seven. Uh, he is asking the bridesmaid mm, and boys to see, attend his bride. She is almost ready. Uh, his bride is ready. She is coming. So he's asking them to attend. <clears throat> uh, and apart from that, Apollo. Apollo is the presiding deity of the day. I told you, uh, see, 16 hours, yeah, 16 stanza of this poem represent. 16 hours of the day and rest of the A stanza, uh, night, uh, night time, refers to the night time. So mostly uh, summertime, their marriage might have happened during summer season. Yeah, so he's asking Apollo to be less intense hmm, on that day. Apollo, the sun god, he's asking sun god to be less intense on that day. It is their marriage day. See, all 365 days are hmm, uh, days belong to Apollo. So he's asking, he's, uh, actually he is, uh, you know, he supplicates in front of Apollo. Uh, let him take 364 days. Hmm? Let all the remaining days be his, but just give him that day. Just make me the hero of this day. I don't want the uh, entire mm, days of the year, but just this day. Now, stanza number eight. So, poet mm, also joins the marriage procession. He is accompanied by other fellow men. Okay. So, <clears throat> see, people are play, uh, playing nuptial songs. Now, stanza number nine, uh, she, I mean, her, his bride, uh, Elizabeth Boyle, comes out of her chamber and uh, her beauty hmm, is come, uh, uh, he, he is praising her beauty. And see, uh, in this poem, several times uh, he has compared uh, hmm, Elizabeth Boyle to Phoebe. Phoebe means moon. Actually, Phoebe is the daughter of moon goddess, okay? That is why I told you this person has incorrectly used so many mythical names. But let it be like that. You may use as he described in the poem, Phoebe is moon goddess. And on another side, let me tell you, Phoebe is also referred to Queen Elizabeth. So he compares his uh, wife or uh, wife to be to Queen Elizabeth. She is not second to any anyone. She is as beautiful as Queen Elizabeth and she is also as beautiful as, you know, the moon goddess. Okay. So he says that, you know, she is an epitome of all feminine qualities. She's very shy, hmm? modest, hmm? Uh, and she blushes hmm? when her praises are being sung. Okay. So uh, she always keeps her uh, eyes lowered because she afraid uh, yeah, she, uh, of that. Her gaze may meet with strange people. Hmm? Yeah, uh, she is. Yeah, she is a Protestant, so she has got high hmm, moral values. So he is praising his beloved in stanza number nine. Now, stanza number ten. The bridal procession passes through the streets, main streets. So on the either side of the streets, so many unmarried girls. Hmm? Unmarried girls of many, yeah, unmarried uh, daughters of many tradesmen are standing on 
the uh, steps and they are there just to see the bride so when they saw elizabeth boyle as a bride they were wonderstruck because they were uh, wonderstruck uh, seeing her great beauty okay now stanza number 11 poet this yeah again describe the procession and the very virtue of the um, his bride because see not only him god goddesses but also the entire uh, unmarried women in that uh, yeah area uh, have wonderstruck with her beauty so in stanza number 11 he is again praising mm, the very virtues of his beloved he compares his wife to that of a beautiful palace mm? and he says that from top to bottom she is like a staircase mm? she is a beautiful palace mm? uh so yeah almost all feminine virtues are mm? there in elizabeth boy which every man seeks to have okay now stanza number 12 the procession reaches the church so 12 stanza number 12 is almost 12 noon 12 noon of the day okay so when the time when the clock struck 12 o'clock mm -hmm. the procession reached church and inside the church they started to proclaim the praise of jesus christ mm -hmm. the marriage is going to be solemnized soon now around 1 o'clock having entered the church hmm? uh see elizabeth boyle is standing in front of the altar and priest addresses her hmm? she uh, and she is now ready to be, uh, become his companion okay for a second entire people forgot yeah there are so many people gathered in the church uh, to attend that holy ceremony hmm? they are solemn uh, priest is solemnizing the marriage in the name of the uh, uh i mean jesus christ and the holy spirit but the rest of the people who gathered in the church they you know they forgot about the uh i mean church and the ceremony they were you know, so wonder struck by her beauty and uh, 14 stanza number 14 around 2 o'clock see after the marriage a grand feast is thrown to the entire villagers okay entire rustic people hmm? then in stanza number 15 he's asking the entire people of the town to leave the daily chores if see uh, these men uh, i mean songsters young men brides brides maid and boy his boys hmm, have lot of duties in the city but he is asking them to leave all their works hmm, for the day because it is is marriage day let them observe this day as sabbath day hmm? sabbath day i hope you know that holy day so all the boys and girls and other people in the town they should take leave for a day they should yeah keep themselves away from all jobs or mundane jobs for this day and they should take part in edmund spencer's marriage and they should observe this day, day as holy day because it is the day uh, where poet is uh, yeah get uh, he is getting uni uh, united with his uh, beloved that is elizabeth boy now stanza number 16 stanza number 16 around 4 o'clock okay so he says that this is the longest year of the day isn't it day time will be more when compared to the night time day time will be more uh, so yeah probably could be march 21st or yeah uh, yeah which is the longest day of the year by the way longest day of the year longest day of the year we you know that december nights are longer than december days so so uh, in this poem uh, 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 i mean edmund spencer often complains about that the day is short uh, yeah longer when compared to the night so probably the longest day of the year anyway you please google it i am in a confusion whether it is june 22nd or march 21st once again yeah so 
<clears throat> see, uh, after the marriage and after the party, this person is really sad. See, it is still four o'clock in the uh, four o'clock. Uh, he he is uh, scolding the sun for being too slow hmm, to go to the western sky. Sun is still there in the sky, and he is you no, know, he is uh, waiting for the night to fall. He just wanted to be alone with his uh, beloved in the chamber. So he is asking sun to go to the western sky. Now around five o'clock. Yeah, around five o'clock he is asking. Dancers, I mean those beautiful nuns, maids, unmarried girls, and boys to stop their games. Come on, Just, hmm? see. Previously, he was so you know, um, uh, yeah, very happy, and he called them. Hmm? He called every people, uh, all people fr from every nook and corner of England to join his marriage. And to celebrate it, now he says that stop all your games. Hmm? Please take my wife to the cha uh, chamber. Okay, now it's all. Everything is enough. Enough for the day. Now please take her to the chamber. And her bed is see the bri bridal chamber is covered with soft lilies and violets. It's because in the second stanza he asked those muses from the forest and rivers to bring. Bunch of flowers to decorate this below and to decorate the bower. So now around five o'clock, he's asking the girls, I mean bridesmaid, to take her to the chamber. Okay. Now around six o'clock, while indulging a description of the night. Yeah. So let me tell you, England at that time was politically unrest. Okay. From yeah. From medieval, early medieval uh, age onwards, England is not politically, you know, uh, settled. It's always, you know, uh, seeking for new, new lands. So it was, you know, England was not in good terms with Ireland, Scotland, yeah, and with neighboring countries. We know that it was England was always uh, on a quest. Always busy extending its territories. So uh, it is a troubled country. England was a uh, troubled country. It can expect attack mm, uh, any time. Mm, any country can, uh, yeah, it can expect uh, attack from any country. So and this person being a diplomat, yeah, he was a Nobel man in, yeah, uh, he holds a, at that time he uh, holds a, he was holding a great position uh, in Ireland. Okay, I told you why uh, he got that Kilcoman Castle. It's for suppressing the Irish rebellion. So he has he is politically related with the hmm, uh, rebe uh, yeah revolutions. He is not safe. He knows that he is not safe. So he can expect any uh, nocturnal attacks. So he is asking God to protect. Uh, him and his beloved from all dangers and evils. Okay, including, uh, 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 I mean, the dangers from evil spirits. And in 19 stanza, around 7 o'clock, he's continuing the same prayer. Okay, same stuff to protect him from, uh, I mean, enemy countries, hmm? soldiers, soldiers of enemy uh, right, uh, countries, uh, other evil spirits. Mm, and from the evil eyes of the people, he continues the same prayer in ninth stanza. I mean, 19 stanza around seven o'clock. Around eight o'clock, see, beloved and the poet is about to enter into the bridal chamber or into the bridal bed. So that room is covered with many curtains. Mm, uh, yeah, uh, that room has got many curtains. So anyway, curtains uh, has the picture of Cupid. Cupid catching. I hope you know Cupid. Whom do we call a Cupid? Cupid is the son of Venus. We know that Venus is the goddess of love, beauty, love and beauty. Hmm? Her son, son's name is Cupid. Uh, somewhat, you know, the very Indian counterpart is Kamdev, isn't it? So Cupid. Yes, yeah. Cupid is... Uh, 
uh, catching the little birds in his nails. So, which is uh, indirectly, it's a connotation showing that poet is about to enjoy his wife's beauty. Hmm? Cupid can, uh, Cupid is poet. Birds stands for Elizabeth Boy. Okay. <clears throat> Indirect meaning. It's reflected in the curtains. Okay. Now, stanza number 21. Solitude of the poet is disturbed by a sudden apparition. So, while they were about to enjoy their nuptial night, somebody peeped in. So, that's sudden apparition. Sudden apparition means apparition ghost, isn't it? Who could be that? That is none but moon goddess again. Three again. So while they were about to make love, somebody peeped into their bedroom through window panes. It's none but moon goddess. Okay. So he became very, you know, uh, he got distracted and he is asking the moon goddess peep. I told you, moon goddess, there, there are two uh, analogy, analogies or two reference here. One is to the Queen Elizabeth and one is to the moon goddess. Okay. Uh, uh, herself okay so here he says that see you moon goddess you have several times enjoyed your private moments with your guy see this moon goddess i think you are familiar with edimion edimion is a shepherd guy uh, uh, with whom moon goddess hmm, fell in love yeah he she was enamored by the great uh, yeah bigger and uh, vitality of the shepherd boy Edimion, and she too has uh, celebrated private moments with Edimion. So similarly, see, it's our night. Hmm? We are going to enjoy this. See, you have already celebrated the night with your guy. Now, why you are peeping inside our room? Just leave us alone. That is one side. Now he is indirectly talking to Queen Elizabeth. Hmm? See. I have given you, see, I am servicing you. I am your obedient, obedient servant. Upon your order, I have gone to Ireland, crushed the rebellion. I have carried out all your orders in utmost respect. In utmost, uh, I mean, uh, in a perfect way, uh, I was able to carry out all your orders. Now, spare us. Spare us for this night. This is Hmm? Our special night. Let us celebrate this night. See, here he says that Moon Goddess has already celebrated her night with Edimion. So on another side, uh, this Queen Elizabeth has got an illicit relationship with Earl of Leicester, patron of Edmund Spencer. I told you Earl of Leicester is the patron of Edmund Spencer. All right. So uh, uh, Edmund Spencer was very handsome, okay, very tall, handsome, and yeah, belonged to the Nobel class. And uh, he had got, you know, great power among uh, other, yeah, among uh, the noble lords of England at that time. So this Queen Elizabeth hmm, was secretly in love with. All of Lee's sister. Anyway, that was an open secret. That was an open secret in England. That is why indirectly, by referring the name of Moon Goddess, he spoke in Queen Elizabeth. See, you are you are, you are enjoying your nights with all of Lee's sister. Hmm? You are having your day. So please spare us. So that is what is mentioned in stanza number 21 around 9 o'clock. Okay, now stanza number 22nd. Now they are entering into their hmm, uh, nuptial bed about to hmm, celebrate the uh, much awaited moment. So he is seeking blessings from Juno, Heave, Hyman, and all. So Juno is the wife of Jupiter, Joe. So we know Zeus is the Greek name, isn't it? Greek name for Jupiter. And Ju uh, Jove is the Roman name for Jupiter. And Juno is the wife of Jupiter. Okay, Jove. So she is the, you know, 
goddess of youth and all youth and he is the goddess of of springs hmm? Ch uh, childbirth and all so he he is asking blessings from juno he he is the daughter of jove and jupiter okay zeus and heba goddess of childbirth okay then we know that hymen it is hymen who uh, gives sanction sanction to lovers to celebrate that night is the one who gives the sanction so he is asking uh, confirmation from all the celestial uh, deities like juno hebe hymen to bless them to have fruitful progenies hmm? fruitful children now in stanza number 23 around 11 o'clock hmm? in the night yeah he is uh, again invoking those gods goddesses residing on mount olympus so just like in hindu mythology see himalaya himalayan mountain ranges are very sacred to hindus right just because we believe that all our god goddesses and lord shiva reside at the summit of mount himalaya right mount kailas similarly you know greek poets hmm, are they believe that almost yeah all greek deities they reside hmm, on the top of mount olympus so again the poet and his beloved hmm, are praising the christian god as well as greek gods hmm, in uh, stanza number 11 so has to bless their i mean nuptial night so that uh, let them consume hmm, their relationship let them uh, celebrate this day and also to have fruitful progenies out of it okay now last stanza that is stanza number 24 around 12 o'clock midnight midnight 12 uh, he is recall yeah he says that he speaks to his beloved after speaking to muses maidens boys people in the city then god goddesses finally he speaks to his wife see you should accept this poem as a wedding gift because actually i really wanted to give you hmm, a lot of precious gifts jewels but due to un uh, unexpected accident hmm, i couldn't give you that so please ac accept this poem this nuptial song as a wedding gift so envoy he presents this envoy in lieu of many ornaments in the place of you should accept this poem or nuptial song in the place of many precious jewels this is my heart this is my overflowing love for you okay that is epithalamium epithalamium is very easy and interesting even though certain words you will find no you won't find difficult because you know once you read you will be able to relate it with the modern english because you know um uh, it's very easy kind of love song it's a love song so it won't be difficult now so that's all about epithalamium now just moving on to prothalamium now prothalamium is also a marriage song but you know it's a pre marriage song unlike epithalamium epithalamium is a marriage song a bridal song uh yeah written for on the day of marriage but this one is a pre marriage song dedicated to lady elizabeth and lady catherine daughters of earl of worcester they are getting married to henry gilford and william peter okay on 18th november 1596 so this poem has written before the marriage okay and let me tell you this is the last poetical work of edmund spenser and the subtitle of the poem is a spousal verse and let me tell you uh, henry gilford and william peter they are the sons of earl of essex after the death of earl of leicester spenser found his new patron in El earl of essex okay earl of essex so let me tell you 
uh, there is a secret motive behind write, writing this poem just because he really wanted to have some benefits from all of Essex. Okay, that is why he has written this poem. All of Essex is the son, uh, I mean, father of Henry Guilford and N. William Peter, who married Lady Elizabeth and Lady Catherine. They were the daughters of Earl of Moses too. Now, see, like epithalamium, uh, see, unlike epithalamium, prothalamium is not that diffi difficult. Uh, it's written in ten stanza. Only, yeah, only in ten, there are only ten stanzas in the poem. Uh, it is more musical than epithalamium. Because in epithalamium, uh, the person has forcefully used many mythical alleg uh, you know, allusions, so many bombastic words. Mm? Uh, over, yeah, uh, he has overpraised his beloved out of mm? overflowing love. He has praised his beloved. But in this poem, the, uh, the tone the t uh, is much more musical and sweet and refined. Okay. So that is why Coleridge uh, says that this poem has got a swan-like movement, just like a swan. Hmm? Uh, the very rhyme, is, rhyme rhythm or the very scheme of this poem is like the movement of a swan. Now let's discuss the first answer of the poem. Calm was the day through the trembling air. Sweet breathing sapphire did softly play. A gentle spirit that lightly did delay. Hot titans beams which then did glister fair when I whom sullen care through discontent of my long fruitless day in princess court and expectation vain. Oh, idle hopes which still do fly away like empty shadows did afflict my brains. Brain. See, B-R-A-Y-N-E is B-R-A-I-N brain, modern English. Walk forth to ease my pain along the shores of Silver streaming Thames, whose rutty bank, the which his river hence, was painted all with variable flowers, and all the meadows adorned with dainty gems, fit to deck the maiden's bower and crown their paramours against the bridal day. This is not long. Sweet Thames, run softly till I end my song. So, in the First answer. I told you this poem is written in honor of the double marriage uh, of Elizabeth and Catherine, the daughter of four sisters, Earl of four sisters, to uh, they're getting married to William Peter and Henry Guilford. Okay, so now let's discuss. Calm was the day through the trembling air, sweet breathing sapphire did softly play. So that particular day on which this person has written the prothalamin, that day was intensely calm. Hmm? And sweet breathing sapphire did softly play. Sapphire, we know that the god of West Wind, the god of West Wind. So actually the day was pleasantly calm. Hmm? Uh, the sapphire, the West Wind was hmm, blowing in a very sweet manner. Uh, yeah, wind was very gentle then. Then, a gentle spirit that lightly did delay. Hot titan's beams which then did blister fair. Titan is sun. Okay. Uh, here, sorry. Uh, holy titans. Let me tell you something. Uh, not only upon earth. You know, even in heaven, there are power changes. Hmm? God may changes frequently. Not only on earth. Uh that government or the so-called political power uh, keeps on changing, but it is also applicable in, it is applicable in heaven. Okay, so, you know, the first rulers were titans, titans. Thereafter, only the Olympians arrived. So the first sun god was Hyperion. The first sun god was Hyperion. After his reign, Apollo came. So Typrion belonged to Titans and Apollo belongs to Olympians. Ah, yeah, I mean, power clash was, you know, that was common among gods, power clash between Titans. Okay, so let me tell you, on that particular day, the rays of sun was very mild for, a, for, a, for some moments. 
the days of sun was uh, rays of sun was very mild but it uh, it didn't last long you know for some time the day was very mild but you know uh, the day is very calm a uh, sapphire is blowing very i mean the west wind is blowing very gently the rays of sun are less intense perfect day a beautiful romantic day but what happened when i whom sullen care through discontent of my long fruitless stay in prince's court see he is not in a mood to bother all these beautiful atmospheric or uh, beautiful ambience or uh, the beautiful condition hmm? because his heart he was very much weighed down with uh his long fruitless stay in ireland see this person has been to ireland and crushed the irish rebellion and he thought that he would be called back by uh elizabeth and he'll be getting a good position in england court but he hasn't got any such offer from queen elizabeth so he has grown discontent or dissatisfied with his long fruitless stay in ireland and he says that he had big big expectation all those expectation has gone in vain became really fruitless okay all his hopes were simply fruit futile so all those loss hopes and expectation now started hurting him afflicting his brain so in order to reduce that heaviness see this yeah, uh, what is what i said is See, i already told you this person is very ambitious he always wanted to improve his status so he is waiting for a new position so thinking about that he was very much weighed down by his uh, feelings so in order to reduce that heaviness of the heart he is walking beside river okay see walk for to ease my pain along the shore of uh, streaming things he was walking by the uh, uh, side of or the by the bank of river things whose rutty bank which his river hence was painted all with variable flowers so the bank of river things is covered with variable colored flowers okay this person is uh, in order to reduce the heaviness of his heart he is walking by the side of river things and whose bank is covered with beautiful colored flowers okay and those flowers are perfect enough fit enough to decorate any maiden's chamber see these flowers are compared to beautiful gems so it can decorate any maiden's chamber and they are quiet enough to make the crown for their paramours for their partners using that flower if one can make crown for bridegroom so anyway the bridal day is coming against the bridal day b r y d a l e is the present bridal okay bridal day anyway uh, he says that the those flowers are pretty uh, good or uh, suitable enough to make enough to decorate any barber's chain uh, any any bridal chamber or to make crown for their bride <laughs> grooms okay anyway that day is not too far away that expected the much awaited day is not too far away until then sweet things run softly till i end my song so in epithalamium the recurring line was you know it was would shall to me answer and my echo ring in prothalamium the last line sweet things run softly till i end my song that is the recurring line a uh, repeated line the refrain okay so <clears throat> that is what is said in uh stands on number 1 he is simply walking by the side of river things thinking about his disillusioned uh life about his fallen hopes and expectation at that time he noticed the river side river side is beautifully hmm, covered with the varied colored flowers fit enough to be uh yeah fit enough to decorate made in chamber and to make a uh, bridegroom's crown so in stanza 2 uh 
while he was walking along the bank he accidentally hmm, uh, so two beautiful dancers gathering flowers from the meadow yeah so those two dancers are none but nymphs okay some girls were gathering flowers from the uh, meadow nearby so those let's see why they are gathering flowers so they are gathering flowers for someone very special so in stanza number 3 poet explains that these nymphs were gathering flowers for lady elizabeth and lady catherine now lady elizabeth and lady catherine they are described as swans swans in the poem okay uh so in stanza number 3 poet see, uh, sees two swans swimming down from river lee so let me tell you river lee is a tributary of tributary of river mulla in ireland in ireland okay so these swans are swimming down from river lee so these two ladies are described as swans okay so then the poet hmm, the poet saw that uh, the names of the muses the, uh, who were collecting flowers from the meadows uh, they were in you know, rushing to see the swans swimming in the river lee until then they were collecting flowers from the meadow but in stanza 4 when they heard that these two swans are coming hmm, they rushed to see them now in stanza number 5 you know these names hmm, those girls who were collect who have collected flowers from the meadow uh, they started to shower those flower upon the swans so you know uh, now the river is covered with flowers hmm, the river why they have uh, showered flowers upon those swans because they are lady elizabeth and lady catherine are going to get married on the following uh, day so in order to congratulate them in order to praise them they have showered they have bestowed flowers upon them okay now in stanza 6 poet again invokes venus cupid just like in epithalamium he is invoking this being a, a bridal you know what do you call pre marriage song he is invoking venus goddess of love and yeah cupid her son to bless these swans because see they are very beautiful right so they may get hmm, there are chances that they'll be uh, they are some evil eyes are upon them yeah, it's possible that uh, people can hmm, uh, cast hmm, evil eyes upon them so he is asking venus and cupid to protect them even the very smile is enough hmm? the very smile of venus and cupid is enough to protect these ladies from the evil eyes so he is asking god and goddesses to save these ladies from evil eyes and also he is asking other nymphs to sing the song just like in epithalamium he is asking the nymphs to sing the song in praise of these ladies so in stanza number 7 nymphs started to sing the song hmm? after the see one of the nymphs completed her song the then the other continued hmm, the rest and let me tell you after that other fowls other birds see these two are i mean lady catherine and lady elizabeth are described as swans so now they are accompanied by other flock i mean other fowls other birds okay so have you seen for marriage procession uh, the bride will be accompanied by maids isn't it uh, yeah girls similarly these swans are accompanied by other birds in the river so you know these swans were encircled by them just like a train just like uh, serving a queen other birds of lower reputation or you know second in beauty they enlarged or encircled these two swans and they did their best service so you know edmund spencer 
has used the simile here. These two spans in the within the circle of other birds, the swans, Lady Elizabeth and Lady Catherine, now encircled by other ladies, other girls, are compared to moon in the sky. Just like the moon outshines the stars, isn't it? Uh, we know that stars are much bigger and brighter than moon, but when we look from Earth, moon is bigger and brighter than other stars, isn't it? It is the moon that outshines the other stars. Similarly, along with among other girls, these two ladies, hmm, these two ladies has out, uh, yeah, uh, I mean, these two uh, ladies uh, have outshone them, okay. They out, uh, yes, they outshine other girls or other birds in the river. They were that much beautiful. Now, these swans, these ladies, they are swimming right down from the river Lee, which is one of the tributaries of River Mulla in Ireland. So they started swimming uh, from the river Mulla. Now they have reached London. I mean, these vans reached London. So, you know, who came to receive them? Earl of Essex, the present sponsor or the present patron of Edmund Spencer came out to receive them. So he says that that person is a, a, a magnificent figure in England because he is the uh, one who helped England to attain most of his territory. To ex uh, he is the one who helped England to ex expand his territories. Okay. So hearing his very name, uh, the people in other countries, the kings in other countries, hmm, they always, uh, you know, trampled with fear. So uh, he's such a magnificent uh, figure in England. Okay. He compares the very person to uh, that of great deities, Essex, Earl of Essex. So Lord Essex hmm, went uh, along with the bridegrooms, that is Henry Guilford and William Peter. Hmm? Uh, they were his sons. So along with them, Lord Essex went to the river to receive the swans. So on reaching the land, these swans suddenly became the bride, Lady Elizabeth and Lady uh, Catherine. They suddenly, you know, um, removes their marks and they begin the brides and they are getting married in the following day. So that's all about prothalamins. Very simple, okay? Very simple. Just a second. Yeah, hold, for a, hold for a second. Hello, are you people still there? Hello? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma yes. Okay, one second, one second. Now we have three more sonnets. Sonnets are very simple when compared to prothalamine and epithalamine. It's very simple, okay? Now let's move on to the sonnets from Amrity. So you have to study sonnet number 34, sonnet number 67, and sonnet number 77. Please note it. Sonnet number 34. This one is sonnet number 34. Another one is sonnet number 67. And sonnet number 77. All these sonnets are love songs taken from Amrati, dedicated to Elizabeth Boy. Okay. Now, very simple. So, like a light has a ship that through the ocean wide by conduct of some star that make her way, when as a storm hath dimmed her rust. Trusty guide out of her coast doth wander far astray. So I who star that born with her bright ray, me to direct the cloud is overcast. Do wander now in darkness and dismay through the hidden perils round about me placed. Yet hope I well that when this storm is past, my hell is the low star of my life will shine again and look on me at last with lovely light to clear my cloudy grief. Till then I wander careful, comfortless in secret sorrow and sad pensiveness. So this is a beautiful love song. So he has used many similes, many similes and metaphor. Let me tell you, uh, first of all, you may please note the similes here. Ship 
See, like as a ship, ship is none but Edmund Spencer compared himself to that of a ship wandering in the ocean. Ship is Edmund Spencer, and ocean is the life. Life, ocean is the life, and storms, storms, bad weather, hmm? bad storms and bad weather are problems in life, and the Lord Star. I mean the North Pole. So what do you call it? the Pole Star? The Pole Star in the sky is his beloved Elizabeth Boyle. Have you got the connections, similes? I mean comparisons. I repeat, ship is Edmund Spencer. Ship is Edmund Spencer. Uh, <coughs> ship is Edmund Spencer. Then ocean is the life. Ocean is the life. Cloudy sky. And yeah, storms are the problems in life. Pole star, that is North Star or the Lord Star is Elizabeth Boyle. So let, let, let us start. Like as a ship that threw the ocean wide by conduct of some star that make her way. So in early days, in ancient days, you know how our sailors, hmm, how, you, how they used to sail in the ocean. They use the very uh, primitive method. They depended the pole star, isn't it? That's how they used to uh, travel. Oh, they, that's how they used to sail in the sea, isn't it? So, what happens when that uh, when the sky is clouded? They won't get the help of the pole star, isn't it? Only during cloud uh, clear, uh, yeah. Only when the sky is clear. They will get that, uh, yeah, able to follow the very direction hmm? uh, in the direction of, they will be able to move in the direction of the pole star. Or at least they have to work the compass. So, like a ship, our Edmund Spencer hmm, is now sailing in an ocean, in a troubled ocean, because the climate and the weather is not at all very supportive. Hmm? Uh, the ocean is very troubled. That means his life is very much troubled. Why? Th there are some problems in life. By conduct of some star. Okay. So far, till uh, <clears throat> that time, he was guided by pole star. That means until then, he was guided by his wife. That make her way. When has a stormy had dimmed her trusty gate? But some storm has caused hmm? or dimmed the sky. The cloud sunstorm has dimmed the sky. Similarly, certain problems in their life hmm, separated them, separated Edmund Spencer and his beloved. So he lost the very gu guidance of his wife. Edmund Spencer lost the very guidance of his wife, just like a ship loses the guidance of the pole star during a stormy night. Okay. So I who star that warm with a uh, bright ray, me to direct the cloud is overcast. Do wander now in darkness and dismay. So the very condition of Edmund Spencer without the guidance of Elizabeth Boyle is very pathetic. It's just like a ship wandering in darkness and dismay without direction. It's just like a river, uh, I mean ship without any direction. Through per hidden perils round about me, place yet hope I uh, yet hope I well that when this storm is past, my hell is the low star of my life will shine again. So you know, problems are quite natural in life, just like uh, you know, upon sea, a sea sailor can expect hmm, bad cl uh, climate or bad weather any time. That is quite natural, but it won't last long forever, isn't it? It won't last long forever. Uh, the, the, the cloud or the sky will get clear the next moment. So when the sky gets clear, when the sky is cle uh, cleared, you know, the pole star will shine again in the sky. Uh, similarly, problems are there in life. It's not going to last long forever. So once the problems in life subsides, once those problems get solved, obviously she will come back to me. She will come back to me. Okay, I will be directed again by my beloved Elizabeth Boyle. Similarly, 
once the cloud hmm, or storm gets subsided the ship will be guided again by the pole star until then both the ship and edmund spencer will have to wander comfortless and he will have to carry that secret sorrow until then okay it is a simple poem actually entire poem runs on that simile hmm? the ship and the pole star ship and the pole star edmund spencer is the ship and the pole star is the wife now let's moving on to the other poem another sonnet that's sonnet number 67 like has a huntsman after weary chase seeing the game from him escape away sits down to rest him in some shady place with panting hounds beguiled of their prey so after long pursuit and vain essay when i all weary had chased forsook the gentle dear returned the same self way thinking to quench her thirst at the next brook there she beholding me with milder look sought not to fly but fearless still did abide till i in hand her yet half trembling took with her own good will her firmly tied strange thing may seem to see a beast so wild so goodly one with her own will beguile so let me tell you uh, for the previous poem he has used the spenserian rhyming scheme oh yeah for this one the rhyming scheme was you know uh, his own that is a b a b b c b c c d c d e e sonnet number 34 is written in spenserian rhyming scheme this one sonnet number 67 has got a different rhyming scheme where he has followed shakespeare's rhyming scheme the rhyming scheme of sonnet number 67 is different a b a b c d c d e f e f g g not it a b a b c d c d e f e f g g that is shakespearean scheme okay sonnet number 67 is written in shakespearean rhyming scheme and there is just like in sonnet number 34 sonnet number 67 has also got a couple of similes where uh, see here edmund spencer compare himself to that of a huntsman hunter he says that he compared himself to a hunter and his beloved to a deer a prey a victim a prey deer deer okay so here he says that like a huntsman after weary chase seeing the game from him escape every uh, escape away sit down to rest him in a, some shady place so our edmund spencer just like a hunter has been chasing his beloved for some time but every time when he was about to catch the prey or the deer or when he was about to touch the elizabeth boy she uh, makes a narrow escape from him or the prey makes a narrow escape from the hunter okay and after hmm, a long chase hmm, this person has got exhausted now he is sitting under a tree to take some rest so what happened with panting hounds beguile of their prey so after long pursuit and vain essay when all are uh, when i all weary had the chase forsook general dear returned the same self way so now he is panting hmm? is out of breath hmm? after the long pursuit is out of breath so he stopped chasing her sitting under the shade of a tree at that time what happened the gentle deer the gentle prey returned see just like in real life isn't it it's quite funny isn't it girls ah not all, every not in every situation but girls at times you know they like possessiveness they like being chased isn't it even though the girl uh, likes a yeah boy uh, they are not going to give you know confirmation at the beginning itself they will make them walk behind them for some days some months say like up to the girl isn't it actually she is indirectly enjoying uh, yeah she is enjoying being chased similarly the deer is also enjoying being chased by the yeah 
uh, hunter. So Elizabeth Bo here, Elizabeth Boyle is actually she really loves that the poet is chasing her. But what happened? Uh, the the girl or the Elizabeth Boyle or the deer will uh, yeah they will uh, keep on running until the person or the hunter or the boy is chasing them, isn't it? Once the hunter stops the chase or once the boy stops his pursuit after the beloved, what will happen? She too will uh, stop running away from the hunter or the poet, isn't it? Isn't it? Whenever the boys, with, uh, whenever the boys withdraw from their pursuit or whenever the lover withdraw from the pursuit, Obviously, girls get closer to them, oh, isn't it? Because they love, girls love attention. They want it to be pursued, chased, possessed. Once they get, once, yeah, once all the attention that they are getting stopped, obviously, they will come to the, come back to the point, isn't it? Back to that point. Similarly, Elizabeth Boyle or the deer, has returned to the hunter. So this time she is not going um, near to him, but somewhat near. Uh, she, when the poet was sitting under the shade of the tree, or the hunter was sitting under the shade of the tree, this deer came near the river to quench her thirst. She was drinking water from the river. There she beholding me with milder look, sought not to fly, but fearless still by. So this time, uh, she is not that scary. She is not casting any scary look. Her looks have become milder. Now she is not so uh, showing any sign of hmm, fleeing away from him. Actually, uh, previously, when uh, if she goes somewhere near uh, by her, then she will fly from there. But this time, she doesn't appear to fly from there. Uh, she is not, you know, uh, she doesn't seem to be in uh, fear, but uh, she has somewhat attained that calmness. Till I in hand her, yet half trembling, took, and with her own goodwill her firmly tied. So at that time only he understood something, you know, it's better to wait rather than chasing someone, because the best gift is given rather than pursued. See? Uh, he wanted her hand, but with her own uh, will, hmm? with her own goodwill. Rather than pursuing, rather than forcing her to give the love, he wanted her to give her own. I mean, uh, he, the poet wanted the love of his beloved without, yeah, without forcing her. She should give the love her own. Strange thing may seem to see a beast so wild, so goodly one with her own uh, will beguile. So what does he say? He says that, see, the gift is the best when served without asking, without being pursued, isn't it? Uh, we are getting a lot of gifts, but the surprise gifts or the one we get without asking is the greatest, isn't it? Similarly, so far, he was pursuing or chasing Edmund, sorry, uh, Elizabeth Boyle. At that time, she had gone away from him. But when the boy stopped chasing her, she came back to him, her own. So he says that the love that she has given at her own goodwill is the best received gift ever in his life. Okay, now moving on to last poem. That is sonnet number 77. Or, uh, yeah, Shakespeare, not Shakespearean. Uh, Spencerian scheme. Okay. <clears throat> Was it a dream or did I see it plain? A goodly table of pure ivory, all spread with junk and spit to entertain the greatest prince with pompous royalty, among which the in a silver dish did lay. Two golden apples of unvalued price for passing those which Hercules came by, or those which Atlanta did entice. Exceeding sweet yet void of sinful wise, that many sought yet none could ever taste. Sweet fruit of pleasure brought from paradise by love himself and his garden plus. 
Her breast that table was so richly spread, my thoughts the guest which would thereon have fed. This poem is very interesting. I'm not telling the similes because he, uh, yeah, you yeah, see. Uh, here also poet has used a metaphor. Mm, yeah, this time it's not a simile, but metaphor. Okay, substitution, a direct comparison. See, was it a dream or did I see it plain? So Edmund Spencer is asking, is it a dream or a reality? What I'm seeing in front of me is asking to himself, is it a dream or a reality? Hmm? Because he has seen something in front of him, a goodly table of pure ivory. So in front of him, there is a, a neat table made of pure ivory. There is a uh, expensive table made of pure ivory. The table is spread with a lot of food items in order to entertain a prince. I repeat you, or I repeat, he says he can't believe his fortune. A person can believe his luck. So Edmund Spencer is, uh, is asking to himself, am I in a dream or is it a reality? What is in front of me? Oh, it is an expensive table made of pure ivory. The table is spread, hmm, filled with hmm, uh, a lot of food items. So has to entertain some great prince. Hmm? Uh, all those food items are spread uh, on the table. It is to entertain some prince. Among which there is a silver dish did lay to golden apples of unvalued price. So I told you the table has got many food items. It is filled or is spread with a lot of food items. What? But what attracted our Edmund Spencer is two golden apples on the on a silver plate. There are a lot of food items on that uh, ivory table. But it is two golden apple in a silver plate that attracted our author's or poet's attention. So for passing, so now he gives, uh, there is a mythical allusion here, a mythical reference here. See, for passing those which Hercules came by, for those which Atlanta enters, see, these golden apples in the silver plate, the golden apples in the silver plates are as beautiful and as sweet as those apple Hercules has stolen from, uh, you know, from the garden of uh, Evening Star. Okay, Hesperus. She is the daughter of Evening Star, Hesperus. Okay. So he says that the golden apple in the silver table on that ivory, yeah, sorry, in the silver plate on that ivory table is as beautiful as, they are as beautiful as apples stolen by Hercules from the garden of goddess Hesperidus. Again, all those which Atlanta did entice the sweet, exceeding the sweet, yet void of sinful wise. There is again one more comparison. Those apples are hmm, as beautiful as Atlanta has, hmm, uh, where Atlanta was a, yeah, was, let me tell you a story. Atlanta is a Amazon woman, an Amazon warrior. I hope you are familiar with Amazon warrior since you are watching them, uh, you have heard about the movie, what do you call it? Wonder Woman and all. Yeah, she is an Amazon warrior and she is the swiftest lady on earth the yeah the fastest lady on earth actually she hates all mankind she doesn't want to get married so upon her father's request to get married she made uh, one condition that she's uh, she told her father that she's ready to marry but the one who uh, mm, seeks her hand should outrace her outrace her okay he should defeat her in the race okay if he fails if the particular suitor fails in the competition then he will be executed that was the condition put forward by atlanta okay so so many suitors from different part of the world hmm, came seeking the hand of atlanta okay at last there came hippomenes hippomenes is a greek youth 
Hippo Mewe is a Greek youth. He knows that it is difficult. It, it is impossible to defeat Atlanta because she has got the uh, boom, isn't it? She has got that skill or that talent or the very rare skill that it is impossible. No man on earth, yeah, no living thing on earth can defeat Atlanta because she is the swift, swiftest lady on earth. So this guy, he wants to, you know, plan. He wants to plot something uh, like that. Uh, yeah, make some plan for defeating Atlanta. So you know what he did? He has stolen some apples, some golden apples from Hesperus Garden. And when they started running, when Hippomemis started running with Atlanta, you know, when Atlanta, oh uh, yeah, gained the laps. I mean, uh, he put he he has thrown one apple. Hmm? So she was distracted. So he was able to, uh, you know, cover her. So in the next lap, when Atlanta again advanced, our um, Hippomemi, he again thrown another apple. Okay. So he was able to, you know, uh, cover Atlanta in a few distance. Okay. Like that, when he reached the final lap, final lap, you know, you know what he did? He, he has thrown the last apple. So at that time, he, she was purely distracted by the last apple. Uh, at that time, our Hippo Mimi was able to defeat Atlanta. So that's how Hippo Mimi defeated Atlanta and he married her. Okay, he was able to outwit Atlanta through those beautiful apples. So what does the poet meant here by referring to two golden apples to those of uh, one store, uh, yeah, those stolen by Hercules from the garden of uh, Evening Star and the one Hippomemis used to uh, outrace Atlanta. So he says that those apples were as beautiful and as godly and sweet as the one used by Hercules and Hippomemi for some noble missions. Okay, so that many sort yet none could ever taste. So these apples were actually chased, pursued by many people. See, so many people attempted to taste those beautiful apples, but no one was lucky enough to taste it. Sweet fruit of pleasure. Those apples are such a sweet fruit of pleasure brought from paradise. Okay, these uh, uh, apples are grown hmm, on the trees in the paradise. Okay. But, uh, and it is reared. Hmm? It is reared and looked after by love himself, Venus or Cupid. Hmm? Uh, yeah, Cupid himself. And in, in his garden, her breast that the table was so richly spread. Now the poet is disclosing what the table is. See, those apples are not but the bosom, hmm? the breast of his uh, Elizabeth boy. Okay, the breast of the beloved. And the table, ivory table is nothing but the very beautiful body of the Elizabeth boy. And the prince, hmm, the guest upon the dais. Yeah, the guest upon the dais are his thoughts or the poet himself. So who is going to have the royal feast? The prince, that means Edmund Spencer is going to have the royal feast. The royal feast is none but Elizabeth Boyle. I told you the two golden apples are her boobs or her breast. Hmm? And the table, ivory table is her beautiful body. So have you got the connection, comparison? So that's all about the block two. It's very simple and it's very interesting.